Hi, and welcome to Cloudigy Law's Everyday IP. I'm Jennifer Atkins, joining you here on our Everyday IP show, where we talk about intellectual property and technology issues that are making headlines. We try to talk about them in plain English so that you can understand how they affect your life and your business. We do these shows to try to help you think about how to find, protect, and grow your uh, content and creations, your intellectual property. So this week we're switching it up a little bit as we have been the last few weeks. Um, I am remote right now, um, but I'm joined by uh, someone in our office. Uh, so this week, because we're talking about music and copyright, which is a uh, requested topic, uh, if you were asked that we talk about this, I thought it would be great to uh, join my colleague, Frank Galino, who is not only a lawyer, but also a m musician in his own right. He's a bass trombonist and a composer. Um, so he has lots of practical experience with music and copyright and thinking through these issues. So uh, he is there in our Cloudigy offices. So welcome, Frank, and thanks for joining us. Hi, Jen. Thanks so much for having me. Hey, uh, well, it's great to, to see you and to chat with you. Um, so I thought maybe what we do is give our viewers and listeners uh, just sort of an overview of music and copyrights and how it's copyrightable and then talk about it from your perspective uh, as someone who creates uh, music and the things that, that you do and maybe some practical pointers. Sure, that sounds great. Okay, so, um, so as we all know, music can be copyrighted, right? Um, and we've written about this and talked about this a lot. Um, and a recent issue that's been made some news in a couple of different cases is what exactly is copyrightable in music? Um, and so Frank, can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure, you know I'm always a big fan of our copyright discussion. I know, right. <laughs> um, so as you know, intellectual property is um, this aspect of property law stuff that you can't put a lien on, you can't repossess. Um, it derives all of its value from being able to control it. And um, so copyright really is just a, a whole bundle of other property rights that include things like the right to physically duplicate, but also the right to perform publicly in the term, you know, in the, in the case of music. Um, there are a lot of different rights that are associated with copyright ownership and control. A lot of people don't realize that in the case of music that's recorded commercially, there are separate copyrights to the underlying composition as well as to the recording that's made. And uh, if you're trying to use a recording, you want to be sure that you're licensing not only that recording, but also the underlying musical work. And a lot of this copyright litigation in music comes up over one or the other or both. Um, it can be complicated. Uh, sometimes you have to license those two things from separate sources and separate owners. But in general, um, the purpose of copyright law is to just protect the people who create this original work in the first place. That's right. That's right. And we, um, so as you said, and I think it's a really important point to make, um, is that really what, what copyright is, is a, a bundle of rights and the ability to control something. And with music, you know, when we think about it with respect to a book, it's really easy to understand what it means to copy a physical page of a book, right? Um, and with music, it's a little bit harder, right? Um, and especially since we have music played on the radio and we kind of have music as the background of our lives, uh, it, like we don't really stop to think about what that really means. Um, and so, you know, as you said, there are different aspects. One of the things that came up recently is um, in the Blurred Lines copyright case uh, where Robin Thicke and Farrell Williams faced a lawsuit from Mar Marvin Gaye's estate uh, claiming that they had um, their song Blurred Lines actually stole from and infringed on a song by Marvin Gaye. Um, and one of the issues in that case that I thought was really interesting is that the... Um, original work that they the plaintiffs were relying on was a uh, piece of music that was written before 1972. Um, and the rules before 1972 were uh, there was no copyright on a sound recording of a music. All you could do really is register your copyright in the written form of the music. So file the sheet music with the copyright office and that formed the basis of your copyright. Um, and so you would have your 
your sheet music like you see here, um, and that would be it, right? So obviously it would be played, it would be performed. The playing and performing of that would actually constitute infringement unless you licensed it um, for uh, player performance. But um, you know there wasn't actually a sound recording. So after 1972, songs that were um, recorded, those have separate sound recording copyrights. So both the underlying composition in the form of the written music that's um, supplied to the Copyright Office, but also the actual sound recording of that music too. Um, so, you know, it, it can get a little complicated. Um, and as we saw in that blurred, blurred Lines case, you know, the jury was limited to just the sheet music. Uh, at the time, it seemed like a huge victory for the defense, uh, but it turned out not to be, right? <laughs> yeah, and I mean, we've talked about it a little bit in the past, but I think that case definitely came out wrong. And um, in my opinion, limiting it to the sheet music should make those pieces even more distinguishable from each other. Right. And we did see that result. So later on in this year, it's been a big year for musical copyrights uh, in the Led Zeppelin case, right, which had a similar issue, a similar limitation. Uh, and in that case, it seems to have helped the, the defense. Right. Led Zeppelin was sued by Spirit for um, allegedly pilfering the intro to Stairway to Heaven. And in that case, um, the jury was not legally allowed to listen to the original recordings of the two pieces side by side. Instead, they had an expert perform both of them on like a piano or something, something mm -hmm. musical, um, based solely off of the sheet music. And uh, Led Zeppelin wound up winning. Uh, I don't think it was any more or less of a clear cut case than the Blurred Lines one though. Yeah, it, it's really interesting. So it can make a big difference. Um, and so all of this is a little bit esoteric, right? In copyright law, uh, because we're talking about um, a, a very specific part, but getting back to music. So you can copyright your sheet music and you can copyright your actual performed recorded version um, of that song. And, and you can file those with the Copyright Office. And of course, registering with the Copyright Office is important. So I actually really wanted to get your take, Frank, as a musician, as a composer, um, how do you approach, you know, when you're writing a piece of music, when you're um, going through your process as a composer, um, how do you approach copyright? How does it work? And then um, I think we also had some really good discussions about your relationships with publishers too. So yeah. I think it'd be really helpful for folks to hear about that. So, I, you know, I've published uh, close to 30 musical works. And uh, when I'm writing, I'm not trying to... Uh, you know, tiptoe and be like, am I infringing on something? Because, you know, a lot of composers are influenced by people who have written things before them. That's just the, the way it works. So I try not to get hung up, you know, in my creative process on copyright law. But at the same time, uh, when I've written something uh, original, I want to know where all those rights lie and who's controlling what. Uh, because as a composer, if I'm going to publish an original work, uh, you know, there's, in most cases, your publishing contract will require you to assign ownership of the copyright over to the publisher, because when a publisher decides that they want to publish one of your works, they put in a pretty significant investment into, you know, publishing, marketing, distributing, billing orders, that kind of stuff. So um, the publisher's security interest mostly is in um, ownership of your copyright. That's right. And so, and that you'll see in your contract, right? I mean, that's sort of when you start your relationship with your publisher, you're going to gonna know um, whether it's a relationship where the, the publisher says, look for all of this investment, we want you to assign the copyright to us, or whether they say, okay, you know, this relationship really is you giving us a license, you still hold the right. Right. There's a difference and you see contracts that go both ways. Sometimes it's a license uh, that reverts back at the termination of the publishing relationship. Sometimes it's an assignment. But um, the interesting thing is it's really all a creature of contract. And you do have a lot of freedom when it comes to copyright assignments. They do have to be in writing. Any assignment of a copyright that's not in writing is totally invalid. But the, uh, the contractual instrument through which you do this, I mean, you can set a term of years, you can exchange the assignment of the copyright for royalty. 
um, there's a lot of terms that you are free to agree on. There are no sort of default rules in uh, assigning copyrights or crafting a publisher relationship. That's right. Um, and we've seen that a lot, I think, in some stories in pop culture um, about artists really kind of taking control. And obviously, um, it depends, right? I mean, you're a composer now who's done 30 different pieces of music. You've got something behind you where you can sort of maybe assert yourself a little bit and say, whereas maybe if you're brand new to the business, you're you're, you're maybe not on the most equal bargaining, uh, bargaining uh, stand there. Right. In most cases, if you're engaging a publisher, it's because you need what they're selling. Yeah. You need their distribution network. Uh, you need their physical skills in terms of making your sheet music look beautiful. And, uh, you know, that's the trade off is you exchange uh, the copyright often for a royalty share. Um, but I'm very fortunate to have really great relationships with all of my publishers. Uh, I published through three different publishers, including one that allows me to retain ownership of my copyrights. So sort of depending on what the product is, uh, I know where I want to market it and which publisher I prefer to work with. That's really interesting. So, I mean, I love hearing these kind of very practical perspectives um, because this is kind of what we do, right? I mean, there's there's lots of really interesting things that end up before the Supreme Court and kind of esoteric issues of copyright law. But at the end of the day, you know, I find intellectual property law really is the field of law that most touches people in business um, and in their daily lives in a way that you know we might not even really think about um, and so I, I think it's really really helpful to hear uh, from you about you know your perspective not as a lawyer but as a musician as a composer someone who's out there creating whose creations are then protected by this um, so do you register your um, copyrights or do you have um, do you do the public, I guess if, it, if by contract they own the copyright, the publishers register it. Yeah, the, the copyrights that I own, I've registered. Um, you know, as soon as you create something, as soon as you reduce something to a tangible form, it's the term of art, uh, common law copyright vests in that work. So as soon as you write down your grocery list, it's copyrighted. <laughs> um, that's, that's just the way it is, except if you are relying on that copyright that common law copyright as something to enforce, uh, that's tough. Whereas if you have registered your work with the Library of Congress and you have a federally registered protected copyright, you automatically get access to venue in federal court. You get a presumption that your copyright is valid. You have access to pursue statutory damages. Um, and you're really in a much better position enforcement wise if you have registered your copyright with the Library of Congress. That's right. Um, so we've talked a little bit about the copyright from the composer and the musician perspective, the copyright owner's perspective. Um, I also want to talk a little bit about our the musical copyright from the perspective of the user. Um, and this could be someone who's creating YouTube videos or who is using uh, music. Actually, I was just reading about um, your music on hold, right? On your phone system um, and, or using music maybe in your shop or in your bar or restaurant, whether it's playing recorded music or having bands come in. Um, there's lots of places we're using music and we see a lot, a lot, a lot of um, litigation by licensing companies and artists, um, people who hold copyrights against uh, small business owners even. I mean, don't think you're going to fly under the radar, right? <laughs> um, we see a lot of that filed in federal court, big litigation. Um, so, you know, how do you avoid being on the, on the receiving end of that kind of litigation? I think that might be really helpful for people watching to, to get a sense of that. Well, I have to tell you, believe it or not, uh, this is, I think, one of the most interesting areas of copyright law to me is um, the bar and restaurant industry yeah. um, because there is no bar there's no you know dive place in the middle of nowhere that is too far off the beaten path um, they will find you these performing rights organizations bmi ascap csac they all protect a catalog of music and it's their job to enforce um, performance violations basically and 
you know, you mentioned earlier that this is an aspect of the law that really touches on everybody's lives in a sort of practical way. Um, a lot of times these venues will be infringing on copyrights completely by accident. It's right. They're not going out of their way to say, I'm not going to buy a license, but we're going to play this music. Um, so I guess the breakdown is on one hand, you have live performances. Maybe you have live music a few nights a week. You let cover bands come in or whatever. Uh, and then on the other hand, you have the use of pre-recorded music, like playing a CD over the stereo. Both of those would be considered a public performance for copyright purposes. That's right. Um, a small exception uh, is for regular broadcast TV and regular terrestrial radio. You are exempt from licensing if you are just playing the regular radio or the regular TV, provided that your venue is something like 3,750 square feet or smaller. Yeah, it's really small. Uh, you have no more than one speaker per room and you don't have a TV bigger than 55 inches or something like this. Um, but regardless of the size of your venue, regardless of how many speakers or how many TV screens, if you have a live band or if you're playing a CD, you have to license those performances or satellite radio or cable television. All of these things require licensing. You can't just say, I own a restaurant. I want to liven up the joint and have, you know, a cover band come in on uh, Saturday night. Yeah. I, the music they're covering is probably protected. That's right. And, and we see this repeatedly over and over and over again, people getting in trouble. Um, and, and I think that there is sort of an element out there that says, well, who's going to find me, right? I'm just going to throw this CD on. No one will ever know. Um, you know, I do think you're right that there are a lot of people who violate this without even really knowing that they're violating anything. But I do think there are a significant number of people who just go, ah, who's going to know? Um, and the answer is they'll find you, right? I mean, we see it all the time. Yeah, I mean, uh, the big performing rights organizations will send people out there sort of like mystery shoppers. Uh, you don't know if the guy sitting in the back eating wings all night works for BMI. That's right. I mean, these lawsuits that we see getting filed against venues, um, they include pretty detailed lists of on this date, you performed this song. On this date, you performed this song. And it's because there was a guy there watching yeah. And uh, there was a case a few years ago about this mom and pop bar in the middle of Ohio that was an hour and a half from the nearest city. And, uh, you know, BMI found them. And yeah. uh, we talked a little, a little bit earlier about um, when you federally register your copyright, you have access to statutory damages and the presumption that your copyright is valid. The damages that you are automatically entitled to are extremely steep. And BMI and ASCAP, they are staying on top of things in terms of um, registering these copyrights. And so they've already taken all of those steps to be entitled to the maximum damages. And so that means when they sue your little mom and pop restaurant for 40 songs that you've played, you're gonna, they're going to get statutory damages for each and every one of those instances and of for, copyright infringement. For willful infringement, you're talking 150000 per song. Yeah per song. It can be, it can be really, really, really steep. Um, put you out of business. Absolutely. It will. And so, and so this is why we say, don't gamble, don't gamble. And even with the like radio and the small number of speakers in the square footage, right? Like if you're anywhere close, like consult a lawyer, find out what you're doing. Um, you know, there are, it is not hard to get licensing for your various uses, right? You contact BNI, you contact ASCAP, you contact these organizations. There are blanket licenses you can get. They're not that expensive. They will um, sell you a blanket license that covers their entire catalog. And depending on the size of your venue and the number of nights per week that you're presenting music, it could be a few hundred or a few thousand dollars a year. Yeah. Whereas, Way better than statutory damages. <laughs> even on one song. Yeah. Yeah. And it gives you a whole catalog, right? Um, yeah. You know, for instance, BMI uh, protects 8.5 million songs. And so if you're a small bar and, you know, you are either going to be playing the radio or you're going to have cover bands coming in, you might put down a thousand bucks or 1500 bucks for the year. 
um, and then you have access to all 8.5 million songs. It's, and you don't have to worry about it. No, you don't have to worry about it. You're really buying the peace of mind um, because if they do find you, again, because they've been registered federally, they don't have to prove that they were harmed $150,000. They don't yeah. have to prove damage. It's automatic. Yeah. Uh, and especially if you've done the, the poor thing, and I was just reading, there's some recently filed cases uh, in our local court here against uh, some places. And, you know, they say, look, we, we tried, we sent cease and desist letters. We tried to get these restaurants to buy licenses. Uh, you know, they essentially crumpled up our letters and threw them in the trash. So now we're filing a suit and hey, that's willful infringement. That is the top level of damages that we can get. I mean, that's, you know, if you get a cease and desist letter, pay attention to it and call a lawyer. <laughs> yeah. Don't just throw it in the trash can, uh, which apparently people do. There's uh, no easier way to prove willful infringement than to say, look, here's copies of the letters we sent them on this date and this date and this date, and we never heard back. And um, we told them to stop. We gave them a chance. And now 150 grand a song. Yeah. So we've talked a lot about um, the restaurants and bars and venues. And I think it's so, so important to make sure that um, if you are having a venue like that, if you're playing music on a CD, if you're having bands come in, whatever you're doing, uh, please, please, please make sure that you are appropriately licensing. Contact these licensing agencies or contact an attorney who can do it for you. Uh, make sure you're dotting your I's and crossing your T's. You do not want to be on the receiving end. Um, the one thing we haven't talked about is the use of music online. Um, and of course, the, the super famous case that we've talked about a couple of times on the show and in various podcasts was the, um, the Lentz case earlier this year, or I guess last year now, um, where uh, the woman had a YouTube video with a Prince song in the back, and there's a huge copyright litigation over that. Um, but, but stepping off you know, from that and, and talking about if I'm putting together, say I want to make a little movie on YouTube for my business, I want to use it as advertising or, um, you know, something like that. And I want to use music with it. Uh, the same thing applies. And actually, you know, you think you, you think that they couldn't find you in some podunk thing outside an hour and a half outside a city in Ohio. If you're on the Internet, they can find you really fast. <laughs> There are bots that go through the internet looking, right, and, and, and finding all instances of this, of songs and stuff on the internet. Right. So, yeah, that's a, that's a whole different realm, and that's sort of more akin to using uh, music in movies or on television or anything else. You're in, in the world of what they call synchronization rights. Anytime that you're taking an existing musical work and linking it up with video, whether it's TV, movies, commercials, your, you know, the show you're making for YouTube, any of that, um, you're in this sync rights, this sync licensing world. And when you're talking about uh, synchronization rights, those are freely negotiable. So if you go to the rights holder and you say, I want to use your song in my movie or on my YouTube channel, they're free to say no. Mm hmm or they're free to say yes and charge you whatever they want. That's right. That's right. And, and there are ways. So I always sort of, um, when I'm talking to people who are doing this stuff, I try to sort of give, you know, there are three paths you can take, right? One path is if you really want to know who owns the copyright, make your own music, right? <laughs> like compose your own, then you're going to have no, uh, no qualms about using it because you'll know that it came from you. It's sort of like taking a photo too, right? If you really want to know that that photo is not infringing, take your own photo. Um, uh, so that's one path. Obviously, most people who are doing this are not talented musicians and composers like yourself. So that's probably not a really obvious path. The, so the second one is to find um, royalty free and there are royalty free um, music. There are services that you can buy um, fairly inexpensively um, and you can get kind of a catalog of various music. Um, uh, they, people do this a lot for their music on hold. They're sort of this very inexpensive music because it's not recognizable. Um, and you can do that relatively inexpensive. You can go through Harry Fox agency or any number of licensing agencies out there that sell music for exactly this purpose. And oftentimes sell it in like 30 second, 60 second, you know, 90 second, two minute chunks um, for specifically for use with varying lengths of video. 
Um, or you can do the other, which is the, the BMI ASCAP again, if you're looking for it, or directly to an artist, if you're looking to use a very specific piece of music. Um, but you got to go get that license because man, they will find you. <laughs> if you, if you put it on your video and you put that video online, um, those bots are going to find you faster than you'd think. Obviously I would advocate for just hiring a composer. That's right. <laughs> can hire Frank. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, if, if you, if you want to use existing music, um, there are places that will do the licensing aspect of it for you. You reach out to them and their services where you say, Hey, I want to use this. They'll track down the rights holders and figure something out for you. If you want something that's really niche, something, you know, if you're making a movie and that you know precisely that you need this one song for your scene, um, and that your whole movie falls apart if you don't get this song. If you let the other side know that, they might hold out <laughs> for more money, uh, you know, knowing how important it is to your project. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's a whole aspect of negotiation that comes into it where it's like, you don't necessarily want to tip your hand and show how badly you need this particular piece of music. Because the other option is, um, you know, if you can't afford to license the iconic recording of whatever song it is, you can license the underlying work and then hire a band to do a new recording of it and, mm -hmm. you know, make your own recording of this work. But it's not going to be the same if it's important that you have the iconic recognizable version. Right, exactly, exactly. And that, that kind of brings us full circle back to that sort of sheet music versus sound recording mm -hmm. aspect, right? That there are multiple different ways of these, um, of music being protected and of course, multiple um, panoplies of rights that go along with, with all of that. Um, yeah. This has been really a great uh, conversation, Frank. I'm so glad that you were able to join me today. I really appreciate it um, and appreciate the ability to do this show from everywhere <laughs> um, to talk about music and to talk about copyright. Uh, if you're out there listening, viewing, um, and you have questions about music and copyright, you can always contact us uh, via Facebook, via Twitter, via email. We are info at Cloudergy Law on email. On Facebook, we're Cloudergy Law. On Twitter, we're at Cloudergy Law. Uh, check out our Decoding IP blog. There are a ton of posts and podcasts um, that delve into the Led Zeppelin case, that delve into, uh, we didn't even get to it, but the Happy Birthday case, which is a, a, a song where someone was trying to license Happy Birthday to use it in a film. Uh, the, the licensor was char charging too much money and they ended up in litigation and it turns out happy birthday is in the public domain. Uh, so good news for the folks writing that documentary. Um, as always, uh, we enjoy having you here with us on Everyday IP. Check out our website, check out our blog, and we will not be here next week. We wish everybody a fantastic Christmas if you celebrate it or holiday break if you don't. Um, and we will be back after that with more Everyday IP. Thanks for joining us.